Well, I would like to begin this morning uh, where we are going to end up in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. It says this, in the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so in verse 5, we see a command. And the command is this, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. That as Christians, we are to clothe ourselves with humility. And the clothing industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and a major part of our culture because we care about how we look. We care about how we dress. It's very important to us. We will spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of energy thinking about what we're going to wear. You know, recently I came across a very popular ad from the 1970s. Now, I wasn't alive in the 1970s, so I don't know if people actually dressed this way, but evidently this ad got a lot of traction in the 70s. So here is the ad. Uh, here's a picture. One easy piece. And the claim of this ad is that this is the climax of human fashion, that it's never going to get better than this. And as you know, that this, is part of a, or this was part of a fashion trend. And every decade goes through a fashion trend or fashion trends because how we clothe ourselves physically is very important to us. We, we care about how we clothe ourselves. So we're constantly thinking, how can we look better and better and better and better? But I would submit to you that how we clothe our souls is infinitely more important than how we clothe our bodies. And the tendency for us as human beings is to spend all this time, money, energy, and, and energy considering how to make ourselves look good on the outside, considering how we might present ourselves to others, and we're not all that concerned with how we present ourselves to God. And my hope for this morning is that we would all leave here committed to clothing ourselves with humility before God and one another, that we would leave here saying, God, by your grace, I want to clothe myself with humility. That I, I want to obey this command in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, and clothe myself with humility. And when we come to Luke chapter 9, we find that the disciples have not clothed themselves with humility, but rather with pride. And because of the devastating nature of pride, Jesus moves to teach his disciples about true humility. And through this story, we're going to learn three things about pride. Number one is this, pride is divisive. Pride is divisive. What is the true nature of pride? When pride is operating in our lives, what is the true nature of pride? It is divisive. Verse 46 says, an argument started among them about who was the greatest of them. So here we find the 12 disciples in an argument. And to argue is not inherently sinful. There are many spirited debates that are appropriate for people to have that are not inherently sinful. In fact, many of those debates can be honoring to Christ, but this was not one of them. Uh, they are debating about who is the greatest Christian, uh, who is the best follower of Jesus. They knew that Jesus was the King, the Messiah, so he's number one, but who's number two? Who's the second greatest? And who's the third greatest? And who's the fourth greatest? And who's the fifth greatest? They were all fighting for the top position in the kingdom of God. And the reason they were doing this is because they were walking in pride. And whenever you find fighting, whenever you see people working against one another, making arguments in their souls at least about why they're better than other people, pride is at the root. One or both parties in an argument are walking in pride. So in your marriage, when you guys get into a fight, one of you is walking in pride or maybe both of you are walking in pride. That is the way that it works. Roommates, when roommates get into a fight, that's what's going on. Friends, when they get into a fight, one or both parties are operating in pride. Pride is at the root of fighting, of broken relationships. Pride is the spring from which all sins flow. It is at the root of everything that is wrong with us. When you look at the world and you see the brokenness of the world, what is wrong with the world? It is the pride of men. It is our, it is our pride as human beings that produces everything that is wrong. It is, it is the spring from which all evil flows, human pride. C.S. Lewis says, for pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. It is cancer. It is poison to our souls, but it is so common. 
But why does pride lead to fighting? Why does pride lead to broken relationships? Why does this happen? Well, there are many reasons, but one reason is this, is that pride seeks the place of God in our lives. That's what pride is. It seeks the place of God in our lives. It is self-exaltation. In the Hebrew language, when you look at the word pride, that's what it means. It means for a human being to lift yourself up, to put yourself in a high position. It is pride that says, I need to be at the center. It is pride that says, I need to be in control. It is pride that says, I'm going to call the shots in my life, that I will decide what is right and wrong for me. I will be the authority of my life. I will decide how I run my family. I will decide what I do with my money. I will decide what I do with my body. That is the very nature of pride. It is pride that seeks the place of God. It wants to be God, not over everybody, but over my life. Lewis Smead, a Christian writer, says this, Pride, in the spiritual sense, is refusal to let God be God. It is to grab God's status for your own self. It is turning down God's invitation to join the dance of life as a creature in his garden and wishing instead to be the creator. Independent, reliant on your own resources, and that is the greatest delusion, the delusional fantasy of all fantasies, the cosmic put on. The very nature of pride is to exalt yourself, and it is as natural for us as breathing. You don't even think about it. You might think to yourself, well, some people are more prone to being proud than others, and some people, it's easier for them to be humble. That's not true at all. Everyone's default setting on our lives is to be intensely proud. It is, it is to be wise in our own eyes. It is pride that causes us to disagree with God, to trust your own understanding. So when we're confronted with God's word and God says this, but it contradicts what you want to do, it is pride that says, I will do what I want to do. When God says, trust me with your money, and you say, no, I have too many other bills to pay, it is pride that says, I know best. When God says, become a great servant, and you say, no, it is pride that says, I will do what is right in my own eyes. When God says, trust me with your body, what you do sexually, it is pride that says, no, I will do what I want sexually. I'm wise in my own eyes. It is pride that causes us to disagree with God. And you might say, well, I don't even know what God says. Well, it is pride that drives such confidence in ourselves that we feel no need to read God's word. If you look at your soul and you find no appetite for God's word, it is because you are intensely proud. You don't even care what he says. You're just going to do what you want. You're going to do what seems right to you. It is our pride that kills our appetite for God and his word. And this is why pride inevitably leads to conflict and arguments and broken relationships, because everybody is constantly trying to justify being God. This is what we do. This is how we live. We, we have to justify this self-exalted -exalt status. It is pride that justifies the endless preoccupation with self. The reason we are so intensely selfish is because we are so intensely proud. Our desires, our circumstances, our emotions, our relationships, everything is filtered and interpreted through the lens of pride. Proverbs 21.4 says, The lamp that guides the wicked, haughty eyes and an arrogant heart, is sin. So what does a lamp do? A lamp gives light so that you can see. It, it's, it, a lamp is the way that you interpret and see everything that's going on around you. But what is the lamp, the natural lamp of our life? Haughty eyes and an arrogant heart. That is the light by which we see. It is the way that we interpret everything around us. And so pride serves as a lens that helps us make sense out of life. It guides our choices. You know, this week I was, I was making a list of all the ways that pride works itself out in my life. And it's too depressing, so I'm not going to share with you all of them. But I just want to, I'm just going to show you a few, just a few things that I think we can probably all relate to. So how does pride show its head? How does it start to pop out? Well, one way is that if you're in a picture, like there's a group picture, maybe you and your friends and family are in a picture and you finally get to look at the picture, who's the first person you look at in the picture? <clears throat> it's you. You look at yourself. Inevitably, your eyes find you and you evaluate how you look. And it, it is a great group picture if you like the way you look. Isn't that the way that it goes? If, even if everyone else looks like pure trash, you, they look terrible, but you look good. It is a great group picture. But 
If you don't like the way you look and everyone else looks good, you say, you know what, maybe we should take another picture. <laughs> you know, this, let's get this one right. We want to get this picture right. And you would never say it quite like that, but that's what's happening. You evaluate the group picture on the basis of the way you look. Why is that? Because we're so consumed with ourselves. Or when you walk into a room, isn't it, isn't it so natural to figure out how you stack up next to people? You know, am I smarter than these people or dumber than these people? Do I have more education than these people or less education? Am I richer or poorer than them? Am I more accomplished or less, less accomplished? Or what about my kids? How do my kids behave? Are they better behaved than every, everyone else's kids or are they worse than everyone else's kids? This is natural. We're just trying to figure out how do we stack up next to other people? And if there are single people who walk into a room with other single people, you better watch out. I mean, just like clockwork, with guys at least, what's going to happen is there are single ladies around. They're going to put their peacock feathers on. They're going to start strutting around, trying to get the attention of other female peacocks, I guess, <laughs> this illustration. But you get, you get what I'm saying. They, they start to act differently because they're interested in whether or not I can get the attention of women. And women do the same thing. Why is that? Because we're deeply selfish. We're concerned about ourselves. Haughty eyes and an arrogant heart is the lamp by which we see everything. We are constantly looking for ways to justify being worthy of running our lives. Have you guys seen the honor roll uh, bumper stickers? My kid is an honor roll student. Here's a picture. Uh, my child is an honor roll student at Pioneer Elementary School. Now, for the record, I'm not saying this is bad at all. If you have stickers like this, that's totally fine and good. But what happens if you don't have a child who's on the honor roll at your school? Then what sticker do you put on your car? How do you handle this? Well, I've, I've actually seen this bumper sticker before. If you want to go to the next one. My kid will make your honor roll student tap out in less than 30 seconds. <laughs> and you think, okay, so not, my, my kid's maybe not the best student, but he can make honor roll students tap out, and so now I feel good about that. But, but what happens if you have a kid who's not on an honor roll, or not on the honor roll, and can't beat up honor roll students? So now what do you do? What bumper sticker do you put up? Well, here's one that I've seen before. My kid sells weed to your honor student. <laughs> you just got to keep figuring out the way, how can I be proud of my kids? And it just keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going. You, you we're trying to figure it out. And you might be thinking, well, I don't put bumper stickers on my car. Now, do you see the subtlety of pride? That now the reason you're better than other people is because you don't put bumper stickers on your car. I'm too classy for that. I don't live vicariously through my children. I don't boast about my kids. That's why I'm better than you. This is the way that pride works. It just keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. It is so natural for us to compare ourselves to derive our standing in the world. C.S. Lewis says, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only having more of it than the next man. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride is gone. It's all about stacking up. How does my family stack up? How do I stack up with the people that I'm around? It is pride in us that rejoices when other people stumble. Have you ever noticed that about yourself? That when people around you fail, there's a big part of you that rejoices? People who are ahead of you at work, if they don't perform the way that they had been performing, there's a part of you that rejoices? I mean, this, is, this is just the way that it works across the board. It is so ugly, and it is so wrong, and it is so unloving. And this is, the ex this is the exact opposite thing that Jesus wanted his disciples to be doing. Jesus wanted his disciples to be a unit, where they love one another, they serve one another, they lift up one another, but they're fighting with one another. Everyone was against the disciples. Everyone was against Jesus. The Pharisees were against them. The Romans were against them. The flesh, the sinful flesh that these men had is working against them. Satan and the demonic world is working against the disciples. And here it is their pride that has turned the disciples against one another. They are fighting. They are arguing. They are working against each other. Why is that? Because pride is divisive. 
It is divisive. That's what it does. Number two, pride is difficult. Pride is difficult. Let me explain what I mean. Pride is difficult to deal with. It is difficult to deal with because it is so subtle and it is so natural. Sometimes if I, if I feel like I'm acting in pride, like I'm really proud and I make a fool out of myself, then I say, man, I was acting really proud. But what you have to understand is that everyone's default every single day is pride. You wake up a proud person. In the morning, you are proud. Your needs, your desires come first. You're at the center. And so pride dies a difficult death. It's not something you deal with once and then it's gone. It doesn't matter if you're not a Christian or you've been a Christian for five minutes or you've been a Christian for five years or you've been a Christian for 50 years. Pride is the greatest threat to your soul. And it is so natural for us. And we see this with the disciples. In verse 46, an argument started among them about who was the greatest of them. And so Jesus is going to deal with their pride, but it doesn't mean that their pride is dealt with. Shortly after this, just a couple months later, we see another episode of pride in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. It says, while going up to Jerusalem. Now, look at, just look at verse 17 and think about what's happening. It says, while going up to Jerusalem. Jesus is at the end of his ministry. He's going up to Jerusalem. It says, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, see, we're going up to Jerusalem. Now, what, what's going to happen there? He's going to die, and he's telling them. I mean, look, look, look at verse 18. See, we're going up to Jerusalem. What's going to happen there? The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, pretty specific, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles, the Romans, to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised. So he's not saying in 10 years this is going to happen. They're on their way to Jerusalem. They're going up to Jerusalem. That, that would be a heavy moment. Could you imagine being there with, the, with Jesus, being one of the disciples? That is a heavy moment. Jesus just shares, we're going up here and I'm going to die. I'm going to be brutally murdered. Now, what would you say? How would you respond to Jesus? If you're there, how, what, what would be going through your mind? Well, James and John, they already had a plan. They already had a question they wanted to ask him regardless of what Jesus said. So we see their response in verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, approached him with her sons, James and John. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? I love that. Jesus says, what do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. So this is the response. Promise me that, we can be, that my sons can be number one and number two in your kingdom. And so they are still totally preoccupied with becoming the greatest. I mean, they are so desperate that they get their mom to ask Jesus on their behalf. Mom, just tell Jesus what you've been telling us for years. We were the cutest babies. We're so strong. We're cute. We're handsome. I mean, that's what you tell us. Tell, tell Jesus and try to get us into those top two positions. And then shortly after this, in John chapter 13, during the Last Supper, you have Jesus with the disciples the 12 disciples in a room right before Jesus goes to the cross and they're all sitting there with stinky feet. The custom was to, to wash your feet before you would eat but no one would wash each other's feet because to wash someone's feet was to rank yourself underneath them. So they're still competing. No one, no one would humble themselves. And so Jesus gets down and one by one he washes the, the feet of the disciples. And you would think that would have made an impression on the disciples. But we are told in Luke chapter 22 what happens just moments after Jesus has given this incredible lesson on not competing with one another but humbly serving one another. Luke 22 says this. This is just a few moments after Jesus washes their feet. Verse 14. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And so this is a huge moment in the life of Jesus and the disciples where Jesus takes the Passover meal and says, this is really pointing to me. He, he takes the bread and says, this, this is my body which is broken for you. This, this wine, this cup, it's a picture of my blood that is going to be poured out for you, for you. That everything in the Old Testament has been pointing to me and I'm here. And this moment in history where I will die on the cross for the sins of the world is about ready to happen. He says, I have fervently desired to eat this meal with you. This is a big moment in the life of, the, of Jesus and the disciples. So imagine you're there. Jesus has already washed your feet, taught you about humility. How are you going to respond? In verse 23. So they began to argue among themselves which of them it could be who was going to do it, who was going to betray him. Then a dispute also arose among them about who should be considered the greatest. I mean, this is outrageous. This is simply outrageous. Their, their response is to debate about who is the greatest follower. Look at Jesus' response in verse 25. Jesus said to them, you guys are the worst friends in human history. It doesn't say that. That's just what I would have said. But I think to myself, this is ridiculous. How in the world are you still fighting about who's the greatest? And when you read about the disciples, I don't know about you, but you know what I can do sometimes? I can look at the disciples and say, why didn't they get it? I can't believe they didn't get it. And I can laugh at them. I can kind of make fun of them a little bit. But then reality sets in and says, wait a moment. That's just my pride ranking myself above the disciples. And I think to myself, if the disciples struggled with pride to this degree in the presence of Jesus, how are you doing? How, are you, how am I doing? It, pride is so difficult to shake. It is a fight that you must fight every day of your life to choose to humble yourself. It dies a difficult death. You don't deal with it once. It is a lifetime battle. Number three, pride is deceitful. Pride is deceitful. Verse 46, again, an argument started among them about who was the greatest of them, who was the greatest follower of Jesus. And if you think about it for a moment, they're making a case to one another about why they should be considered the greatest. Who is the greatest? But what is the substance of their argument? Like, how are they making their case? Well, it has to be on the basis of what they had done. And here is a very important point that you, you cannot miss. Here is the point, is that the grace of God can make you proud. It's, so pride is deceitful in the sense that even the grace of God, receiving grace from God, from God can make you a proud person, which is not the way we would think naturally, but it is so clear that this is what happens. See, the disciples were arguing about which of them, which of the 12 were the greatest, but what is crystal clear is that none of them deserved to be one of the 12. That, that was a grace given to the disciples. And then you think about the fact that Jesus gave them power and authority over sickness and disease and death. Matthew 10, 8 says, heal the sick. This is when Jesus commissions them. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons. Think about that for a moment as a teenager. Being selected to be a disciple of Jesus and then given that type of power the power to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, and drive out demons. And so what happens with the disciples is that it is the grace that they have received that becomes the substance of their pride, the basis of how they're able to argue for their greatness. But the disciples hadn't earned anything. They were simply recipients of grace. And so it makes pride so subtle. It makes pride so difficult to deal with because sometimes we think, okay, I'm not living in the world. I'm not living with this fist-shaking pride towards God where I say, God, I hate you. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm going to live life my own way. We, probably many of us, maybe none of us here are living that way. But see, there is a spiritual pride that is just as deadly as the fist-shaking pride against God. And it is the grace of God that can actually produce this type of spiritual pride. Think about the disciples for a moment. The disciples had the right teacher. Could you ever have a better teacher than Jesus? Everything he taught was perfect. The disciples had the right devotion. 
They were totally devoted to Jesus. They had left everything to follow him. The disciples had been chosen by Jesus. Out of the thousands who wanted to be disciples, it was these 12 who were chosen by God's grace. They were given extraordinary power, power over sickness and disease and death and everything. I mean, they had total power. They had experienced so much. And the result is that they're using the grace that they had been given to compete with one another. I I can envision pretty easily the disciples fighting over who's the greatest by saying, you know, in that one town, uh, there were 20 demon-possessed people, and I cast out all the demons. And then another one says, wait a second, in this other town, there were five paralyzed people and five blind people, and I cast them all, or I dealt with all of them. I healed all of those people. And that's, that's better than casting out demons. And then someone says, in this one town, there were five dead people, and I raised five dead people, Get, brought them right back to life. That's way better than healing someone who's alive. I mean, come on. And then you have Peter, James, and John coming in, and they're saying, have you guys ever heard of the Mount of Transfiguration? Oh, no, you haven't? That's right, because you didn't get invited to go up there. <laughs> have you ever met Moses? Oh, yeah, you haven't met Moses. Uh, we, we have. Or Elijah? Oh, yeah, you, you haven't met him either. I have. And you think that's just pure grace that they had received. It is grace, but it becomes the substance of their argument. And this isn't just a problem with the disciples. You see this in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Paul's dealing with their spiritual pride, and he asks this question, which you should think about here. For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you did not receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast? There it is. What they had received became the basis of their boasting. Why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? Or consider 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6. This is the Apostle Paul. For if I want to boast, I wouldn't be a fool because I would be telling the truth. But I will spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me or hears from me. Verse 7, especially because of the extraordinary revelations. Now think about Paul's life. Dead set on killing Christians. By the grace of God, he's converted. Jesus appears to him and he gives his whole life to Christ. He submits his whole life to Christ. And then Paul is sent as a missionary to spread Christianity, the good news of the gospel to parts of the world that had never heard the good news. And so God uses the Apostle Paul in some remarkable ways, some amazing ways. And then on top of that, God uses the Apostle Paul to write so much of the New Testament. He is so influential. And all of that was grace. Remember, he was a murderer, and Paul knew it. He says, I am the worst of sinners, but God gave me grace. He showed mercy to me. But see, even that grace in the life of the Apostle Paul had the potential for great pride. Look back at verse 7. It says, especially because of the extraordinary revelations. On top of this, Paul was taken to heaven. He had a vision of heaven. And he says, therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not exalt myself. Think about that. God saw pride as such, such an awful threat to Paul that as a preventative measure, this is what God does, is he sends a messenger of Satan to torment Paul. Why? A messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. It was a preventative measure in the life of Paul that he might remain low, that he might be humble, so that he would not exalt himself on the basis of God's grace. And so God sees pride, your natural pride, my natural pride is such a threat, he will do just about anything to keep you low. He will do about anything so that you would not exalt yourself. Exalting yourself is at the root of everything that is wrong in the world. And so pride hides easily within Christianity. To go to church, to be in a Bible study, to serve, to whatever, to share your faith, none of those things will keep you safe from pride. It is so deceptive and it is so destructive. Paul, or not Paul, the Lord Jesus says in Luke 14, verse 11, he says, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled. If you put yourself up, you will be brought low. And on the flip side, the more positive side, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The path to greatness in the kingdom of God is not how high will you go, 
It's will you humble yourself? Will you bring yourself low? Will you make yourself nothing? It's not about will you, will you do something in your life to make yourself great? That's not what it is. The difficulty of the Christian life is will you live your life in such a way where you make yourself nothing? It is so difficult and it requires God's help. Now what do we do? What do we do with this information? What do we do with this story? Well, I have two points of application to close. Number one, clothe yourself with humility before God and others. This is my hope. My hope is that you will leave here today and you will say, God, by your grace, I want to humble myself before you and others. I want to spend significant time and energy not just thinking about how I dress myself physically, but how I clothe myself before you. I want to clothe myself with humility. I want to humble myself before my spouse. I want to humble myself before my kids. I want to humble myself before my friends. I want to humble myself, most importantly, before you, God. I want to bring myself low. Now, how do you do this? Well, look at verse 47. But Jesus, knowing their inner thoughts, took a a little child and had him stand next to him. He told them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. For whoever is least among you, this one is great. So Christianity and following Jesus is not about fighting for the top position. It's about bringing yourself low and becoming a great servant. And as as followers of Jesus, we must be resolute in our soul that we will become great servants. We will become the slaves of all. That serving is not, it is not a bad thing in the kingdom of God. It's not a sign of weakness or being inferior. It is a mark of humility that we are willing to serve. And the thing that's interesting about kids here is that kids were definite, during this time period, they were definitely loved by their parents and appreciated in a variety of ways, but, but within Judaism, they were thought to offer basically nothing to the community. And that, in one sense, is really true. This is, a, this is a young child. So the child, if you read the gospel accounts, the child is young enough that Jesus could pick him up, but old enough that he could stand on his own. So I don't know what age that is, two, three, whatever it is. Small enough to pick up. I mean, it's not like a 15-year-old. Jesus didn't pick up a 15-year-old person here. Small enough to pick up, old enough to stand. And you think about that type of child. And what do they contribute functionally to society? Nothing. They don't, what do they do? They don't help you pay the bills. They don't really help you get work done around your house. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, I love my kids. I would die for my children, I love them. They are, they're, they're wonderful, amazing human beings. But they do not contribute to society that much. Don't they make your life a little more inconvenient? They, they change the whole way that you think about life. Life would be easier in one sense, I'm not saying better, but easier if you didn't have to take care of children. So there, there is this sense in which children do not contribute. And so because of that, what, was, what, what, what would happen is that the rabbis would say, don't bring kids here. Don't bring, we're not gonna teach the kids. We don't teach any children that are under the age of 12 because it's an utter waste of time. It just makes life more difficult. But what Jesus does is he says this. He says, bring this little child to me. He says, here, look, bring, bring him here. He says, look at this little kid. Do you want to know how to worship me? Do you want to know how to follow me? Serve him. Serve her. The one who has nothing to offer you. That's what he says. Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me, my father. You want to receive God? You want to serve him? Welcome little children. Take care of them in his name. And this is the pattern of the kingdom, is that we are to love people and serve people who have nothing to offer us. See, serving your own kids, you have have a dog in the fight there. Serving other people's kids, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. None of the disciples had children at this time, maybe Peter. Jesus did not have any children, and yet Jesus is following this, this pattern of loving and serving and welcoming people who have nothing to offer him. 
And this requires great humility. And this is, this is my hope and prayer for our church is that we would be marked, we would be marked as a church, as being a church who's willing to bring ourselves low, that we'd be willing to serve and love and give our lives away to people who, who cannot repay us. That's the way Jesus lives, but how do we do it? Number two, consider the humility of Jesus. Consider the humility of Jesus. See, remember the subtlety of pride? I, I don't want you to leave here today thinking, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna try really hard. I'm gonna pick myself up by my bootstraps here, and I'm gonna be so, so humble. I'm gonna be such a humble person. In fact, the reason I'm better than you is because I'm a humble person. It, it gets so subtle. And so if you go home and you pick yourself up by your bootstraps, that can become the source, your humility can become the source of your pride. So how do you do it? You have to look at Jesus. You have to see him. There is nothing that will disarm your pride like Jesus. There is nothing that will humble your soul like Jesus. And so what do you consider about him? Well, we're going to spend eternity marveling at him, and so I don't want to pretend like these four things are the only things you need to think about, but I'm going to give you four things to consider about Jesus. Number one, Jesus was eternally exalted. Who is Jesus? Jesus was eternally exalted. Before he became a man, he was eternally exalted. The all-powerful, eternal, self-existing creator of the universe, God Existing in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, apart from creation. That, that, this is who Jesus is. He lacked nothing in any way. He, he had no needs. In John 17, he's praying to the Father. He says, Father, give me the glory I had when I was with you. See, he left his glory, at least a measure of his glory, he left when he became a man. He was glorified and exalted and honored infinitely happy in heaven. Number two, Jesus infinitely humbled himself, so he left that. Jesus left heaven and became a man. The distance between eternal, all-powerful God of heaven and earth, creator of everything, the self-existing God and a man, that distance is infinite. It is infinite. And he, he left heaven and became a man. To exalt yourself is to lift yourself up. It is to put yourself in a high position. To humble yourself is to bring yourself low. It is to put yourself in a low position, to make yourself last. And so in Jesus, we have the greatest demonstration of humility in the history of the world. That though he was highly exalted, the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He became a man, truly God, truly man. And his life was marked by the ultimate act of humility in the history of the world, which was going to the cross. And there he endured utter humiliation that Jesus was not even treated as a human being. At the cross, he wasn't even treated like a human being. He was treated like an animal. And he was beaten beyond recognition. His beard was ripped out, nails were put into his hands and feet, a crown of thorns was placed on his head, and as he hung there suffering, he received no sympathy. No sympathy from the crowds, no sympathy from the Romans, no sympathy from the Jewish leaders. In fact, they were mocking him, they were spitting on him, they were making fun of his claims. He received no sympathy. And so there we have Jesus, the Son of God, hanging on a cross. But why is he there? It happened. Why was he there? He was there for you. He was there for you. He was there for us. It is our pride that drives our sin. And it is our sin that ruins the world. It is our sin that alienates us from God. It is our sin that ruins our relationship with God. It is our sin that makes us fit for hell. Do you know why you're fit for hell? because of your pride. It is your fierce commitment to yourself to live for yourself and to do what you want. It is, it is your pride that makes you fit not for heaven, but for hell. 
Our pride is a sin factory. Day after day, it produces wickedness that flows out of our heart. I'm not saying that every person here is a murderer and you've killed over a thousand people. That's not what I'm saying, but all of us are proud. All of us have broken relationships. All of us have been lustful. All of us have been greedy. All of us have done things that earn our position in hell. But how does God, the God of the universe, the only one who is truly highly exalted and worthy of praise, how does he deal with the pride of human beings? He deals with our pride through the greatest act of humility that the world has ever known. That the way God overcomes our pride is through infinite humility. That though Jesus was highly exalted, he humbled himself infinitely. Why? He, brought, he was high. He went low. Why? To lift you up. To lift us up. See, Jesus became like us. He became true. He was, he was God, and the, he was God, the Son of God, and he became truly man, truly God, truly man. He became just like us so that we can become like him. Now, I'm not saying we become God, but we share in the life of God, that to become a Christian is to be united with Christ so that what is true of Jesus becomes true of you. Ephesians 2, verse 4 says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. When you had nothing to offer him in any way, that is when Christ came. And he says, you were saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus, that though we are fit for hell because of our choices, by the grace of God, through the mercy of God, through the humility of Jesus, in him we have been seated with him in the heavens. It's an incredible reality. See, he, he went low and humbled himself to lift us up. And see, the first step in becoming a Christian is not going to church. Go to church, that's good. It's not reading the Bible. Read the Bible, that's good. But that's not how you become a Christian. The first step in becoming a Christian is humbling yourself. See, salvation is a gift that has to be received. It is not something that you earn. If you try to earn it, you will not get it. It is a gift. It is something that must be received. And see, the gift itself, the gift of salvation is offensive. It is offensive. Why is it offensive? It's offensive because the gift of salvation is the gift of righteousness. Why do you need a gift of righteousness? Because you are not righteous and you cannot make yourself righteous. The gift of salvation is the gift of forgiveness. Why do you need forgiveness? Because you are sinful and you can't cleanse yourself. See, the gift of salvation is the work of God on your behalf. Do you know what the the payment is for your sin? There is only one thing that can pay for the horror of your sin. It is not the blood of animals. It's not the blood of one of your friends. It is not a life given to good deeds. There's only one thing that can forgive sins. And that is the death of the Son of God the sinless, spotless Savior, the the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the the self-existing, all-powerful God who became a man and died in your place. That is the only thing that can truly forgive you. That is the only thing that can pay for your sins. It is his righteous life that we need to be reconciled back to God. And so the first step in becoming a Christian is bringing nothing to God. It is humbling yourself, coming before the Lord and saying, I have nothing to offer you. I I cannot save myself. I cannot earn my salvation. And if you would receive the gift of eternal life, if you would receive Christ, then you would be forgiven. Then he he would give you salvation. And that first step of humility to become a Christian is the way that we live the entire Christian life. It's where we humble ourselves day after day before God. We come to God with our hands open saying, we have nothing to offer you except, what, except God that you would give us something to offer to the world. We are totally dependent on his grace. So Jesus did that for us. Number four, we are to follow his example. 
to be Christians, to consider Christ, to think about following him, what we have to understand is that we are following him. We're not following a church program. We're not following, following some ancient tradition. We are following him. And who is he? He is the all-powerful God who left heaven and became a man and died on the cross for the sins of the world. And we're following him. And if he humbled himself that he might lift others up, what do you think that means for you? That to follow him is to humble ourselves towards one another and to give our lives to helping others. It is to pursue the greatest good for humanity, which is to know Christ. And that we would live lives that are not radically centered on ourselves or on our families, but we live lives that are radically centered on other people, even people who have nothing to offer you. If you look back at verse 48, it says, he told them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. For whoever is least among you, this one is great. And you might think to yourself, well, other people, if I give my life away to other people, they don't have anything to offer me. If that's how you think, you gotta just download the sermon and then listen to it again. I don't know what else to say. Jesus, what do you have to offer him, the Lord Jesus? Nothing. Imagine if the Lord played that game with you. And so you look at people and say, they don't have anything to offer me. Exactly. So what's the motivation? It's him. Look. Then he told them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. So the question is whether or not you want to serve Christ. And the way you serve Christ is by serving these little kids that have nothing to offer you. Will you love people who have nothing to offer you that they might know him? And this is the secret to living the Christian life is recognizing that it's not about people first, it's about Christ. If you want to serve Christ, you serve people. You love people. And as we live that way, our relationship with God grows. As we live that way, we get to know the grace of God better and better and better. And so one thing that is built into this verse, there is something that I think we can't not see, and it's that there's an opportunity for kids' ministry. I don't know how to get around it. These are little kids here in the passage, and Jesus says, disciples, learn how to serve them. And so in the same way, I would say some of you, you don't serve anybody in any way. Maybe maybe your family, and that's good. But that's not what Jesus has in mind here. If you don't serve your family, God says you're worse than an unbeliever. So some people, some of you, you look at your life, and your life, you're not doing anything for anybody. Some of you, you're pouring out your guts day and night, day and night, day and night, and that's a beautiful thing. But I would just recommend to you, you look at your life and say, is my life really centered on others? Do I have a way that I'm really pouring my life out for other people? And if you say, I don't have a way, I would suggest considering getting involved in kids' ministry. Getting involved in serving and teaching these little ones that have nothing to offer you. Now, why would you do it? Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. As an act of worship to the Lord that you would serve others. And so again, I don't want to put some pressure on everybody saying you got to serve X amount of hours, you got to serve this many people. That's not what I'm doing. But before the Lord, as an act of worship to the Lord, I pray, I hope that we be a, a church that is marked by serving other people. And so I'll just let you think about this. You think, how can I, in response to who God is, pour out my life for others? and see what the Lord will do. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. And I I just pray, Lord, that you would would help us as a church to serve, to make ourselves, not to compete with one another, but we would be the greatest servants. And you, Lord Jesus, I mean, you are an example that we will marvel at for all of eternity. And Lord, I I know some people here today are walking in intense pride. And and I pray, Lord, by your grace, you would open up their eyes to see that their pride is like cancer. It's not something to be cherished, but something to be killed. And I pray, Lord, for those who, who are trying to walk with you and love you, I pray, God, that there'd be no undue pressure put on them, but they would just hear from you. 
about how they are to live and serve. I know life is complicated. I know life, there are so many responsibilities. And I pray, Lord, that we would just be humble before you and that we would follow the way that you lead us. And I pray, Lord, that as a result of serving and loving, making you the center of our life, I pray, God, that you would be exalted that there would be genuine humility. And I know, Lord, the only way that happens is if we stare at you. So help us to consider you. Help us to love you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.